Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Justin Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Graduation Day, released May 1st, 1981. It was written by Anne Maurice and Herb Freed, based on a story by David Bond, directed by Herb Freed, and released by IFI Scope 3. IFI Scope 3. What happened to IFI Scopes 1 and 2? Ooh, don't ask. It's a sore <laughs> subject over at IFI Scope. I, I, I really hoped when they were just registering names, like they wanted IFI Scope. But sorry, <laughs> there's already an IFI Scope. I was like, well, uh, can two, we... Two then? No, sorry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the band Felony didn't charge the production for any of the songs that appear in the film. I would have been real offended if they did. <laughs> <laughs> they did it for exposure? Yes, that's exactly what they did. Uh, obviously, this film was jumping on the bandwagon of basing your horror movie on a day of the year because that was so popular at the time. Uh, this was considered a video nasty. This landed in section three, which is the least extreme section, but what a bunch of prudes. There's really nothing. There's really, really pretty tame kills in this yeah. one. A starter pistol is fired and a row of athletes begin jumping hurdles. We see shot put, high jump, pole vault, gymnastics, and we end on the girls' track team. Coach Michaels shouts at Laura to push herself harder and harder, even though she's way ahead of everybody else. Well, and in, in part of the montages, uh, I thought there were, there's, there's like a couple holding Walking hands, off into the distance, I and thought it looks it was, like two guys. Yeah, I thought it was two dudes, and I was like, oh, wow, this is yeah. really progressive. Yeah, like I, I literally, it took to the third pass to realize it was a boy and a girl. Also, this is high school? Like, yep. it, yeah. It, they're, they're putting so much emphasis on these track sports. Yeah. Like, I feel like most high schools, they might have a shot put team. Yeah, or a group, they have like a like, full Olympic squad going. Yeah, there. I don't know if they would have such a such a myriad of uh, options. Cause, yeah, because who do you have to train? You'd have to have a coach who's versed in all of those yeah. things. And you also need schools to p- perform against that have yeah. all the same things. Yeah, that was our problem because we had fencing, but we literally had to go out of state to compete because there was no other schools in state that had a team. We see lots of inserts of coaches stopwatch timing her run. Right when she crosses the line, the stopwatch hits 30 seconds and she collapses across the finish line as the crowd chants her name. A group of fellow athletes, including her best friends and her boyfriend, are horrified to see her hit the dirt unconscious. Her boyfriend Kevin gets to her first, but she is unresponsive. He cradles her body and we fade to black And then we get the director's credit. We fade back up on a newspaper clipping about Laura's death in a passenger's hand. The driver asks if that's an article about the student who died a couple months ago. So it's a couple months after that happened. Oh, you know, I must have missed that. I I, I don't know if I missed the line, but I was confused this entire movie about how much time has passed here. Oh, it's been exactly two months. I thought it was possibly years like like that she was a sophomore and now it's senior year finally yeah. or like i was so confused she was a senior and she was going to graduate with this class and it's really been a short amount of time that yeah. makes so much more sense yeah. yeah i i was confused up until we i saw one of the other students at the school because mm-hmm. i was i was thinking the same thing i thought that this was this person in uniform is one of the classmates mm. now le- have having left high school gone into the military a few years is now coming home for reasons yeah and it turns out it's just a much older sister yeah the passenger doesn't respond to the driver's question and he asks if she knew the deceased it seems like she's a hitchhiker in this situation but in a reverse angle shot we can just see her legs and she's in a navy uniform with her hat in her lap or is it a cap i guess it's a cap uh, is there officer's a, cap is there a definition between hat and cap that makes one versus cap the other? goes on a hat what? <laughs> this, is, this is a boat reference, isn't so, it? It's a boat ship reference. <laughs> the driver, by the way, is a big fat guy with a little mustache, a purple t-shirt that's a couple sizes too small, and a little neckerchief. <laughs> and he looks like a Scooby-Doo extra. 
He keeps stealing glances at her legs, and she continues ignoring him. What's the matter, Ellie? Cat got your tongue? It's okay, I got plenty of tongue for both of us. <laughs> he grabs her bare leg, claiming to be a taxpayer, and then when he ignores her request to move it, she grabs his crotch hard and he lets go of her. We finally see her face here, and we will learn later that this is Anne, the older sister of the deceased Laura. The vehicle drives under a banner strung across the road that says Happy Graduation Day, and when she sees a young girl jogging alongside the car, she asks to get out here. Anne watches the jogger disappear into a park across the street, and we get a tense score as she just stares angrily at the girl. The camera follows the jogger through the park. She's wearing big blocky headphones. Do you recall the last time we saw this kind of headphone? Uh, Bloody Birthday? That's correct. Damn it. Did you know that one? I... I I could picture her, but I couldn't think of what the movie was. <laughs> <laughs> Someone carrying a stopwatch is timing the jogger as she moves through the park. The killer catches up with her and slices at her with a tiny scythe multiple times. We switch to a POV of the back of the girl's head, and blood splashes into the sky, and the jogger's body is just left on the ground. But we can hear the music of Felony, the band we'll see later, playing out of the headphones on the ground. And the camera just holds on her corpse butt Yeah, for like... 20 seconds that's a cool name for a band corpse Corpse butt butt. (laughs) do you have to wait to the moment like of death for a regular butt to become a corpse butt it depends the 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 moment the body hits the ground well we also had a disagreement uh in the two-headed transplant (laughs) if it's a corpse if if the head is still alive yeah somewhere yeah or is it just a removed part it's not a corpse unless the head is dead We cut to students getting their graduation photos taken outside the school. We see someone approaching from the legs down for a moment, but eventually reveal that it's the coach from the opening scene. They're waiting for someone named Paula to arrive so they can pose for a cross-country team photo for the local paper. One of the girls, Sally, says that she's jogging here right now, and we are to understand that we just saw Paula killed in the park. Coach Michaels tells the kids to line up, and then one of them, Tony, levels vague accusations at him. How about it, coach? What was the calculated risk? How many of us were supposed to make it through the season alive? You're out of line, fella. What does he even mean by this? Well, so for I, this is the thing that I don't understand. Everyone in this movie is, like, blaming this coach for her death. And I'm like... Which, by the way, we haven't said it yet in the movie, and we're not going to say it until, like, 40 minutes into the movie. But she died from a blood clot. Yeah. Which yeah. not not physical exertion. It's it, it was not a result of right. exercise. He didn't it, cause this to happen. He just urged her on the way a any coach, coach is, is going to do. do. Yeah. Even if he does it meanly or you know like move your ass, it's still just urging her on the way a coach would urge on their athletes. So but everyone is really upset with this dude. Yeah. Well, we don't know what happened over the last 2 months true so he might have punched a bunch of children or something (laughs) buried a bunch of puppies alive that's true he's the worst the worst they take the picture without paula and the kid picking a fight with coach michaels puts his hands tight around sally's neck for the photo this is supposed to be you know one of those is this a bad guy who knows a funny one where i pretend to murder you (laughs) Anne approaches the front door of a home and her mother answers the door and relays how hard Laura's death was on them without her here. So she never came back. She did not. Because I, she's I in the military, could, yeah. I would guess that they're kind of restrictive about right. when she can come back. No, I get that. I just, again, I was having troubles with the timeline of this movie. So I was like, so this is this is the first time she's been back since the death. And I got the impression that she actually requested this time off so that she could be here for her sister's graduation. Yeah. And so I she was so. going to be here either way, but her sister has sadly passed. Stepdad starts down the stairs. Oh, look, honey, Anne's home. Oh, shit, she look. Apparently, he resents her for being in the Navy. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Mother asks where she's been stationed, and she says Guam. It turns out, after Laura's untimely passing, Anne was invited to accept a trophy at graduation on her sister's behalf. Mom offers to walk her up to Laura's room. Evidently, Anne's parents have converted her bedroom, the bedroom of their surviving daughter, into a dark room. And mom thinks that Anne has forgotten the floor plan of her childhood home and needs to be <laughs> led to Laura's room. Nobody's been there since she died. As Anne heads upstairs, mom asks how long she's staying for. 
and she plans to leave immediately after graduation. Her mom also asks if she plans on keeping, quote, the insurance money, end quote, but I'm not sure what that could possibly be a reference to. Did Laura already have life insurance as a teenager? Um, um yeah, I I had uh I had I had a life insurance policy since I, I was a child. I've, and I've taken out insurance on our kids, so is any of it set to pay off to the other children? It can be. It, can... it could be because you can put whoever you want as the dependents. Yeah. Or or not dependents, but ben- sorry, beneficiaries. Right. It just seems weird that a teenager would have life insurance and that her sister would be listed as the beneficiary. I don't but think that But that seems that to be the case. Maybe I, not. I, like, if you're thinking long term, and I know, sorry, we're spending a lot of time on this. No, it's If fine. you're thinking long term that she probably wouldn't die she till she was much older and the parents would probably be dead by then. Then that's who it should go to. Yeah, but, but then also if she had a family, she would get all those things changed. Right, that makes but sense. But in, in the meantime, this is the only person... Um, or maybe her parents just have like a tontine going on with, yeah. with their kids. <laughs> whoever whoever dies first gets the money. You get everything. Sorry, a tontine. It's a it's they're illegal though, aren't they? Yeah, they are. It's a tontine. It's like a last man standing gets the prize situation, but it encourages murder. Because, <laughs> so they're illegal. Apparently, Anne doesn't care about money, so she's planning on giving all the money to her parents. I wouldn't if I were in that situation. They're like, no, you guys are jerks. You're fine. I'll take the money. Bye. In Laura's room, Anne finds a framed photo of the track team and a bunch of photos of her boyfriend, Kevin. The sister's boyfriend, not Anne's boyfriend. Anne lays her wardrobe bag across the bed and unzips it to reveal a gray sweatshirt and black gloves like we've seen the killer wearing in the killer's POV. Her stepfather surprises her in the room to ask why she didn't call for a ride from the airport. He doesn't understand why the school called her sister in Guam instead of her parents to receive the trophy on laura's behalf and frankly neither do i yeah i don't get that either i feel like it would make as much sense to have this be a week later and the sister was here for the funeral yeah uh but it turns out big sister already missed the funeral stepdad ronald continues shit talking and threatening to slap her i would have slapped some mind in it i wouldn't if i were you i have learned a few things in the military bitch he heeds her warning and leaves the room and she tosses the track team photo on the ground, shattering the glass in the frame. Back at the school, we see an arm in a gray sweatshirt with black leather gloves open a door to a dark locker room. In the person's POV, we cross the room and open a locker to reveal the same photo of the track team in a new frame, and crossfade to a close-up of Paula's face in the picture before Xing it out with lipstick. We cut to Sally walking a path in the woods when suddenly Anne is blocking the path, frightening her. Anne claims, I was looking for the auditorium. In the woods? <laughs> Didn't you go here? Yeah. Like it recently? Seems, I mean, it seems like this little walkway of trees must be immediately next to the school. Or in the middle of the campus. Yes. Like, because like Chico, Chico so State. So many it's kids all in this in the movie wilderness. are on this pathway at some point so it's, it's the same like 20 feet of path yes, too yes. every time yeah. also i didn't realize that this was ann <laughs> oh was like, really i was like who's this person uh because because she's wearing her hair up now yeah and she's obviously she's wearing like you know civilian clothes yeah uh but but it you're was, supposed to dress like an officer everywhere you go yeah now. well <laughs> it's just like I, i'm sorry i have i have a hard time there's so many characters i have face blindness Sally points her where she's trying to go, and Anne compliments Sally's necklace, which is actually an award from the track team, and then she compliments her eyes. You have lovely eyes. My sister had eyes like yours. She's dead now. Oh, gee, well, gotta run. Toodles. (laughs) Isn't Sally a friend of Laura's? Yeah. Wouldn't she be like, oh, you're Laura's sister, and then maybe offer some conversation here? Or would you just think- My condolences? Yeah. (laughs) But instead, she's just like, oh, you're a crazy lady. You're trying to steal my eyes. I'm out. (laughs) Give me your fingernails. (laughs) No. (laughs) We see a man in a powder blue suit conducting a choir and then running to the microphone to introduce Principal Guglioni. He has a tough time getting the kids to shut up so he can talk until he threatens to cancel graduation. You're just going to go to high school forever. For some reason, the kids are all wearing their caps and gowns for this rehearsal. But this isn't the actual graduation. Sally sees Anne enter the auditorium and calls her a weirdo like her sister didn't just die. Anne speaks to the principal's secretary, Blondie, 
and Blondie walks on stage to whisper in Guglioni's ear before he introduces Anne to the class. I would like you to give a warm welcome to Laura Ramstead's sister, Miss Anne Ramstead. Excuse me, Ensign Ramstead. The class claps for her, and they are excused for the afternoon. A few of the kids crowd around Anne to offer their condolences, including Kevin. She thanks him for his letters and then asks if they can talk, but he's suddenly in a rush. Hey. Can we talk? Uh, sure. alone? Catch me later, huh? Well, After school. Kevin? Where? Kevin? <laughs> this drives me crazy in movies when they don't, they don't actually it. coordinate. Yeah. Like, I don't have enough information to actually meet you later. Yeah. I'll see you later. And it's just like they never saw but, each other but, again. Where? When? What? It also bothers me that as all of these students are leaving, they are doing that thing where they toss their hats in the air and then yeah. they aren't getting them. And I'm like, you guys haven't graduated yet. You need those. Go back and get them because yeah. you're going to have to do this again tomorrow. You're just going to be hatless. We cut to Anne holding one of the letters from Kevin and trying to find his address. According to the return address on the envelope, Kevin lives in Midvale, Michigan. So I guess that's where the film takes place, Midvale, Michigan, which is not a real city as far as I can tell. The zip code is actually in Mexicali, Mexico. She walks to his home to speak with him, and when nobody answers the door, she just walks into the house. As As you do. do. Just opens the door and walks on in. She finds an open scrapbook with a picture of Laura. We hear the applause of the track meet, and we flicker from the scrapbook to the footage of her sister's final run, even though Anne wasn't there for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say I really like a lot of the cinematography of sure. this film. Uh, they they do a lot of really interesting cutaways and and like when she's touching it and it's it's going back and forth so quickly. It's like every other frame almost. Yeah, and I was like, damn, that must have been a pain in the ass to, to do edit. by hand. Yeah, but this scene definitely deserves an epilepsy warning here. The house is littered with statues, including a big flesh tone statue that I kept mistaking for a naked dude on the stairs behind her. <laughs> a voice pipes up in the house, and it's an older lady shouting at nobody in particular. It seems she may be suffering from dementia. Anne apologizes and explains that she thought she was alone here. Like, that's a good excuse. Like, oh, sorry, I thought I was in your house by myself going through your things. Then Kevin appears, and he says he was just upstairs. Together, they look again at the scrapbook. And it looks like one of the pictures in the scrapbook is literally of Laura mid-heart attack. She didn't have to die, Kevin. I don't know what that means. What does she didn't have to die mean? She I died in a freak accident that was not caused by anyone. Yeah. She did have to die, Kevin. <laughs> don't listen to Anne. She goes on to say that her life is totally different now that her sister was gone. You were in Guam. <laughs> like, <laughs> how different is your life? I mean, like, emotionally, I get it. You're a wreck. But... It doesn't change what you do day to day out there. It kind of just seems like she wanted to get out of this house, like with this abusive, not abusive, but verbally abusive stepfather. Yeah. And, and just like, was like, well, have fun sister. I'm Yeah, you here. left her there. Kevin tells her that Laura will be with him always. And at this point we assume this means figuratively. <laughs> She gives Kevin the graduation present that she intended to give her sister, a small necklace with a medallion, and then she leaves. We see Sally in the locker room alone. She undresses to her panties as someone watches, breathing heavily from behind her. But but she takes off her dress first and then takes off her shoes? Yeah, it's a little weird. We needed more naked time, Richard. That's true. Yeah, that's true. You got to take the dress off first if we're going to see the underwear for the right amount of time. Yeah, I guess that's fair. First, she takes off all of her clothes, and then she takes like 20 minutes untying her shoes, just naked on the floor. A gloved hand flips off the light switch. Sally calls out to the darkness, but nobody answers. She almost crashes into two more girls entering the locker room, and they all three scream, terrified of each other. The two girls launch into a fully improvised conversation, constantly talking over each other, while Sally struggles to convey that there's someone else in the room. There's someone in the fucking room! (laughs) When she walks to check out the noise that she heard on the door, you can see the bottoms of her feet are just jet black. Yeah, because it's fucking gross in here. Yeah, I was just like, oh, wear sandals in the locker room. You're going to get <laughs> Why did you spend warts. so much time taking your shoes off? <laughs> <laughs> that retrospect, leave them on. <laughs> she gestures to a door that she claims just closed behind them, but when she looks through it, she can't see anything from the doorway 
But it's a big locker room, yeah. and there's plenty of rows of lockers the person could be standing behind. But she doesn't check any further than that. She's just like, oh, just my imagination. And why does the locker room have a locker room? For the <laughs> for the men in black to live in? I don't I can't Because they're already in the locker room. Yeah. And then there's another closed off locker room? Just in case. <laughs> Exhibit designed this place. We put a locker room in your locker room so you can locker room while you locker room. Sorry, I don't get Who's Exhibit? You didn't watch Pimp My Ride? No. <laughs> he would always do things like, we put a TV on your TV so you could TV while you TV. It was very meta. And then it became a meme. And then I used the meme with locker rooms. Got it. The more you know. The two talkative girls tell Sally that they've heard enough, and one of them, Doris, claims that she pissed herself she was so scared, <laughs> and the other girls laugh at her. The actress playing the self-pisser here... <laughs> Is the first feature film appearance of a young Vanna White. Yeah. What? Yeah. We cut to a gymnasium where the newspaper photographer tells Sally that the coach tells people she's good enough for an Olympic team. He asks her to do some turns on the bars and Coach Michaels walks up and says, do the whole routine. But she's not feeling up to it. We see her do the routine because the coach insists that she do it for the newspaper. It's clear this actress is a professional gymnast because they're not swapping her out for a stunt person. Sally sees flashes of her wilderness encounter with Anne and then falls off the bars to the mat distracted. The coach makes her go again because the first try was so sloppy. The photographer tries to explain that he got what he needs, but coach won't have it. Her second turn on the bars is accompanied with some classical music all of a sudden, and coach smiles for most of it, but again, she doesn't stick the landing because she keeps getting distracted in her head. And this is the same coach as the track team yes right he's also the shop teacher he's also the shop teacher he does a few jobs why is he doing all these different like you are a professional gymnast as well as track well, team as well as shop i stuff. think it's pretty common for the the sports coach uh member of the sports? faculty to also at least be the shop teacher and then maybe it's you know it's a small enough school midvale michigan is so small i couldn't even find it on google today <laughs> So I will say that in my high school, uh, several teachers were often the coaches of the team, but I felt that was more like a voluntary thing. They weren't, they weren't like the gym teacher. No, uh, no, no. Yeah, no, I get that. Like we had that too. Our, we had teachers that would be like, this teacher teaches economics and track. I mm-hmm. get that. But that tracks. But you don't also teach gymnastics and Every basketball sport. and volleyball and yeah. like you don't teach them all <laughs> maybe he does though maybe he's just uh what's it called ambidextrous when you, when you know everything what? <laughs> there you go ambidextrous no. no also uh apparently he's fired yeah well we'll get to that <laughs> so, there's a lot of things that we decide not to bring up until past the halfway point of the right. movie like what killed the girl in the inciting incident of the film yeah we never mentioned that it was a blood clot until so much later that by then it's like irrelevant and 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 days go by before they anyone even acknowledges that the first girl we saw killed is even is missing yeah. yeah i assumed when he showed up a second time that the photographer here was going to be a suspect or at least a red herring but we never see him again after this scene We see another insert of Sally's face being crossed out on the track team photo right before she hits the ground, but she's not dead here. Yeah. She just fell again. Well, I was waiting for the bars to snap. Oh, just something terrible happens there? Yeah, like like he he already planned, like, so she's going to be doing her routine, the bar is going to snap, and she's going to, like, fall and break her neck or something. Yeah. Wait, so her face is crossed out before she dies? Yeah. Correct. I didn't notice that. Yeah, because the, the, she's the second girl. It's and they so cross hard to tell out. who they're crossing off in this photo. Right. But I thought the point, the whole point of showing it get crossed off was that we were about to see her die right there yeah. on the bars, and mm-hmm. then she doesn't because unless you're fucking psychic, there's no way to coordinate murdering the person when there's two witnesses standing right next yeah. to her. Well, we think that one of them is the killer, though, because the, the coach... Well, or the photographer. The or, coach or the... But the coach we see in several of these scenes, he's, he's wearing this gray tracksuit. Right. As well. But we also saw Anne has the same gray tracksuit right. for I'm some just saying They're all very popular. They're all... They all have gray tracksuits. It was the style then. Everybody was wearing gray tracksuits with black gloves and murdering teenagers back then. <laughs> and fencing masks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the 80s. I'm going to wear that to the next 80s party I go to. People are going to be like, who are you? And I'll be like, basically everyone in Midvale, Michigan, <laughs> circa 1980. We cut to Sally shaving her legs in a sink in the locker room. 
A black glove opens another locker and pulls out a sword. And would you do this? Would you just shave your legs now? At school no. instead of going home and doing it? it no, you would not. It, it just seems so strange. But also, the sword that he pulls out... Is not like a fencing sword. It's not a fencing sword. It's not, it's not what you would use for, you know, the sport of fencing. It is like... A cosplay sword. Like, it, it has a blade on yeah, it. Yeah, it's like a cutlass. But it's also <laughs> not the one that he uses right. immediately after he takes that sword out of the locker. So he must he have swapped she. it. Or she. He or she or they. who knows. <laughs> they. The black gloves click a stopwatch into motion, and we see the POV of someone approaching Sally as she shaves. She notices the person in a mirror over the sink and turns to ask what they're doing. The sword is pointed closer and closer at the girl's face, and she screams at the point that it's actually thrust through her neck and out the back of her head. But here, it's actually a fencing sword, right? When it uh, pokes through her neck, because when it comes out, it's a pinhole on the back. Yeah, it might It might be. I mean, they're not pointy, but I suppose you could yeah. potentially make one pointy. We cut away to Mr. Roberts, the guy we saw conducting the choir earlier, still in the same powder blue suit. He's playing a piano and singing lounge music surrounded by teenage girls. He brags to them about working in show business and they're eating it up, despite him looking fairly schlubby. I got tired of the parties. Oh, the parties! Oh, I can't stand it! Having to kiss the behinds. All the little things you want to have to do when you're part of the beer. Well, what a oh, line you've oh. met, Mr. Robert. Well, well, really well, how exciting! Yeah, well, when you're an entertainer as I, would, I, as I am. <laughs> Another girl, Dolores, walks into the room and tells the other girls that the bell rang a while ago and they can leave already. So, I wasn't certain who this was. Like, because she... It's a new she, character. Yeah, but she comes in and says, the bell rang a while ago. It's like, oh, is this another teacher? Oh. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> they even go, oh, you know, like, there's no more real classes. It's like... Why, do you, why, why are you, are you bowing to, to this person? girl's authority? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then eventually the piano teacher... Mr. Roberts is like, yeah, get out. We never explain who this guy is, though. I think he's just the music teacher. But he's famous in some way. No, he says he's famous in yeah, some way I, so I, that he I can think. have yeah, sex but with the, students. But the girls are fawning over him. Well, yeah, he knows how to play a piano. That's all it takes. That's all it takes in the 80s. You could look like Stuart Pankin or whoever. <laughs> like Al Franken? Yeah. <laughs> or, or different people whose names rhyme with Stuart Pankin and Al Franken. <laughs> Come on. Come uh, up with one. Alan Menken. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> That's close enough. Who's also a pianist, right? Sort of. Sure. Probably. I'm sure he can play the piano. And looks nothing like this. Kevin Bacon? No. <laughs> You're fired. I think they should be fawning over Kevin Bacon. That is acceptable. <laughs> Alone in the room with Mr. Roberts, Dolores sits on the keys of the piano, and he tells her that she's failing the class unless she takes summer school. She starts to unbutton her shirt. Wait, wait don't do that. I mean, uh, not here. <laughs> Somebody could come in, you know. Dolores moves to lock the door to the classroom, which has windows in it. But yeah. also, one door of at least, like, three doors that we can mm -hmm. see in this single shot. Yeah. And there's probably more. Every choir room I've ever been in had multiple entrances. Yeah. <laughs> But she whips open her shirt on the way back to him and then presses his face into her breasts. This is most of the nudity that we'll get from this actress in the film. But the original actress said she was fine doing nudity and then when they got to the scene was uncomfortable with it. And so she wanted more money to do it. And when they said no, they let her go and they brought on a new actress to play the part. So she took over the role of Dolores partway through filming. Hmm. Not just any actress. Uh, Linnea Quigley, the scream queen... And this is early work for her, so yeah. we'll get more of her stuff later in the 80s. Is there something in particular she's known for? I'm assuming Return of the Living Dead is the one you're going for. Yeah, yeah. The, or, yeah, Living Dead Part 2, where she said she wants to be fucked by a bunch of old men in a graveyard. Yeah. Everybody's favorite scene. You know they play that clip on the Oscars all the time. <laughs> she was on uh, Joe Bob Briggs a lot. Yeah. We see the principal's secretary, Blondie, get a call asking her to come to the office. Blondie, would you come in here for a minute, quick like a bunny? Quick like a what? When she enters his office, the principal gives her an audio cassette of his dictation of a letter. He needs her to write the whole thing out six times and address them individually to different departments. 
She says, it'll take all night. And he says, that's a bummer. Because he wanted to fuck her later tonight. And she says, <laughs> okay, I'll meet you at midnight. She leaves and Gugliani fishes a switchblade out of his jacket hanging on the door to slice up an apple before dropping the knife in a drawer full of switchblades, which I assume <laughs> these are confiscated from students. Uh, also, there is a stopwatch yeah. in the drawer. So we have now like our third or fourth red herring. I think I think the photographer is supposed to be a red herring, and I think Tony, who was who had his hands around the girl's neck, was supposed to be a red herring. So there's so many people where you you know pick your poison here who's mm-hmm. the killer we cut to mr roberts at the piano again and he's getting distracted by a loud thrumming sound from the ventilation shaft he moves downstairs to the boiler room and is weirdly certain that there's a person hiding in here yeah despite exclusively mechanical noises and, so far and and implying that the person who's down here does not belong here right <laughs> like there's no chance that a maintenance person yeah is there's a here. groundskeeper like working in here and he's just like hey Get out of here, whoever you are. You're not allowed to be in here. Only I'm allowed to be in here. (laughs) The piano teacher. (laughs) Suddenly, he's hit with an empty bucket and finally proof someone else is here when a tape cassette starts playing and we hear audio of him and Dolores being inappropriate together. Mr. Roberts, (laughs) you look a lot thinner with your clothes on. Why? Don't you find me attractive? Oh, sure I do. You're okay. You're fine. (laughs) Do you like snakes? I uh, call this my little cobra. Oh, why? Is it poisonous? <laughs> I really wanted him to answer, no, it's venomous. <laughs> <laughs> and then she'd say, what's the difference? And he'd say, you can put this in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a real snake. What? Mr. Roberts follows the sound of the recording until he finds the tape deck, and we see two students scramble out of the boiler room. No idea who they were. Nope. Because they duck around the corner too fast for me to identify a single feature. I don't even know the sexes of these people. I couldn't tell what was happening. So at this point, I had developed a theory, and I really wanted this theory to be true because it was like out of nowhere. And I was like, I thought that the killers were going to be vanna white and that other girl who keeps showing up and interrupting the kills and keep like bumbling into things yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, are they the killers like are they doing it on purpose or is it like a tucker and dale situation where they're just around <laughs> when people yeah. get killed like i was like because they were in there they had the opportunity to plant the tape recorder yeah and i was like oh man what what is what's what is happening is something like is there like going to be a big switcheroo at the end of this and it's not going to be about anything. It's just so almost everyone so far has been a red herring then. Yeah. Because of this new theory where the only two characters I thought couldn't be considered red herrings, Richard now suspected. Yeah, because otherwise there is there is no point to this scene. Yeah. It, it serves nothing. But he finds this tape deck and then he says he knows who put it here and they're in a lot of trouble. But he has no idea who put it here and they're not in any trouble. And we never mention it again. Yeah. We cut back to the wilderness where Dolores and Tony are smoking a joint on a park bench. We see a POV from the bushes watching the couple. Tony confirms for Dolores that he slept with the entire cheerleading squad of a nearby school. We see the legs of someone in khaki pants approaching the couple, and I was already sure it was a cop, because it's just, it was cop pants. But the reveal here is that it's a cop. Dolores tells Tony that the weed is making her horny and tries to undress him until the cop finally steps out to stop them. It's Officer McGregor, a regular hassler of the graduating class, and he lets this infraction slide. Instead of thanking him for giving them a pass, they call him names to his face. I hear narcs are an endangered species. They're not very bright. You see, instead of migrating in the winter, they fly up their own assholes and mate with themselves. And what comes out? McGregor! (laughs) That's funny. That's real funny. Yeah, I'm a police officer. And if I catch you smoking dope around the campus one more time, your ass is mine. I kind of like that he laughed along with them for Mm -hmm. this joke. But why is he letting them go here if they're such shits to him all the time? Yeah. After they leave, we see McGregor pull his gun out of his holster and then remove a joint from the cylinder to smoke it against a tree. We slowly tilt up from high heels to the door to the shop class with a placard that says, George Michael's Woodworking which is one of my favorite albums of the 80s. (laughs) A hand turns the knob, and a woman, of course, the only one we've seen in heels so far, Anne, enters the room. 
The lights are off, but she walks around the room anyway. <laughs> no idea why, since there's clearly no one in here. And suddenly, several machines turn on magically and shoot sparks everywhere. Coach Michaels enters the room and flips on the light. The hell? Are you crazy? These are precision instruments. Snap a blade. I didn't touch your machines. But also, we never explain. Yeah. We never explain why yeah, these machines turn on. This is the only hint at the ghost uh, that is definitely in the movie. What? There's a ghost in this room that did that one thing, and then it's gone for the rest of the movie. Another it's red herring. Favorite. The or ghost. There's just, like, this is the same universe as Maximum Overdrive, but that's, like, right at the edge of where things were being affected. I don't get it. I don't know why these machines turned I, on we, or how you could possibly control this remotely. We never we never find out. No. Like there's no reason for these things to have turned on when she walked past them. But it spooked you for a second, right? No. Michaels is able to guess correctly why she's here. And what'd you come here for? Point a finger at a killer? Well, go ahead. Everybody else in town has. Maybe they know something. They don't know nothing. I didn't realize he was suspected of anything yet. A girl died randomly of an embolism during a track meet. None of the other bodies have even been discovered yet. Why would anyone be accusing him of murder? By the way, we're only finding out here 50 minutes into the movie what killed Laura, a blood clot. Evidently, Coach Michaels is being held accountable for her freak accident and is being fired for it because she had an embolism Yeah. on his watch. Right. There's nothing he could control. I'd say you were getting off easy. Listen, I didn't kill your sister. Oh, no. I loved her. Loved you. You rotten bastard. You and your stupid track team, you pushed her and you killed her. I didn't kill anybody. I gave my life to Laura to all my kids. Yeah, I, I pushed them. I yelled at them. But that didn't mean I didn't care for them. I honestly don't understand how anyone would come to the conclusion that this is Coach Michael's fault that this girl died. Yeah, I mean, even if she had not been a member of the track team, she, if she was pro- prone to getting blood clots, she could have gotten it in the library, sitting yeah. there. You know, maybe running track moved it to her brain faster or whatever. But it whatever was going to do her. that anyway. She it had a time happen. bomb in her body. It was just going to happen eventually. He tells Anne that he worked hard to mold her sister into precision and power, and Anne claims that he treats his students like machines and not people. Running doesn't cause blood clots. She didn't die of a heart attack from overexertion. She died of a blood clot. It's random. He asks why she came here, and she says, I came for an answer. I think I've got it. I don't think you do, Anne. I don't think you get anything. We'll meet again, Michael. We cut to a football player, Ralph, jogging through the wooded path, throwing a ball to himself repeatedly. He encounters the improv twins, Doris and Joanne. My suspected killers. Here it is. Uh, They intercept his self-passes and start playing keep away until Ralph lifts Joanne off the ground. She tosses his ball into the bushes, and then we see an insert of someone in a gray sweatshirt and black gloves with a stopwatch around their neck holding a football kebab. A sword has been stabbed completely through the ball lengthwise, and Ralph finds this person and asks for the ball back until the killer throws a perfect spiral at him and he is stabbed through the chest. A fourth face is crossed out on the track photo in lipstick, and then we cut to the school where Laura's boyfriend Kevin is jamming out on harmonica while another kid plays the guitar and they perform the graduation day blues. Because you know how kids are always sad when they're graduating from high school? See if either of you can uh, decipher this note that I've made, <laughs> because I am at a loss. I just have I have the football stab, and my next note is just the one word, makeshift. Well, it's it's probably like how did he put a sword through a football in a moment's notice and stab somebody? Maybe he it? had a spare football that was already stabbed. So he swapped out the like real Julia football. Like Julia Child. He's like, we have another like, football prepared <laughs> already. It's not like the, the hilt or anything is like sticking out the backside of the football. Like mm-hmm. that has to be inside of the football. So how did he make this Wait, stabby the, football? It's just the blade sticking it's out? It's just a blade. There's no handle on no. the other side? I did not notice that. That's weird. <laughs> 
That's true, because when he catches the ball, it just looks like he caught a football until yeah, he falls yeah, forward and the yeah. blade's sticking out of his back. So how did he make, how did, how did, out of moments notice, did he make this stabby football? I don't know, it's pretty impressive. A lot of sword use, though. Yeah. Okay, so how many people have, have we killed so far? We got... Three? Paula got her, got her throat slit. Yep. The Sally. other girl got stabbed through the neck with a sword, and... This guy got stabbed with a football. This guy got stabbed with a football. Why are we crossing out a fourth face? on the picture because he seems to be preemptively it with the exception of the first one he seems to preemptive they it's who's ever next yeah i guess okay also there's a lot of these seem like especially like this one with the football seem to be like done um as a crime of opportunity yes because you you wouldn't have known that he would be in this exact moment at this exact time like here and i can stab him with a football knife like I, it seems mildly improvised. So how yeah. would you know? You're just like running after him and be like, "Oh, now's my time." I guess you just keep an eye out for anybody who was on that picture. Yeah, but, but I do think it's weird. But that if he's crossing him out right before advance, he kills him, yeah, he's planning weird. this one next. But anyway, so Ralph is dead. We get a quick nothing shot floating down a school hallway as kids do graduation-y things and then cut to Coach Michaels and a female student who apologizes and then gives him a quick kiss before running off. I'm assuming she's apologizing for his recent firing, um, but I don't know. Or, or she's breaking up with him and he was dating a student. But McGregor wanders over to compliment Coach Michaels on all the hot students he gets to hang out with all the time. He got lipstick on here. I love that he just slaps his face. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, McGregor has become my new favorite character yeah. in this movie. Too bad you blew it. So wait, is saying you got lipstick on you or trying to say like, oh, you're crossing off lipstick on the the picture? So you, you No, know I think it, I think it was just a literal reference to that girl just kissed him on the cheek and so he had lipstick on his face. Okay. But it could I'm be I'm just saying like are they trying are they trying bit? to connect it back to like that lipstick is the same as the well, lipstick? Maybe on the picture we cut to that night at a roller rink where the band felony is playing during a light show they're all made up to look like noir era movie gangsters because they're performing a song called the gangster rock We see Tony and Dolores wander back out into the park during the song, and then we see someone follow them out into the wilderness. More epilepsy warnings here. It's also a little weird that the music doesn't turn down at all when we cut outside to follow the couple through the woods, even when they're talking. So this full volume music is blaring over everything they say to each other. They find a comfy spot to lay down on the ground, and the killer's POV watches them. Tony stands up to take a piss before they get started, and Dolores expresses jealousy for Tony's ability to pee anywhere, and he responds, the world is my toilet. The killer approaches him from behind and in a single quick swipe takes Tony's head clean off. Dolores gets impatient waiting for him to finish pissing and then goes to look for him, eventually finding a pale rubber approximation of his head in a bush. She puts her hands over her mouth when suddenly the killer bursts out of the plants in all gray sweatshirt sweatpants and a fencing mask holding a huge broadsword. Do you guys recall the last time we saw someone in a full fencing outfit? Was it the orangutan in uh, Going Ape? It was. <laughs> uh, yeah, but this is a this is again not a sport fencing weapon. Like this is right. Yeah. This is like cosplay style weaponry here. Yeah. The person playing the killer stalking Dolores here is actually director Herb Freed. Do you guys recall the last time we saw the director playing the maniac attacking the actress on screen? Friday the 13th? No. Though there were three people playing Jason in that. Yeah, I thought I had a good chance. <laughs> <laughs> Sporting chance. <laughs> uh, I don't. I guess four people playing Jason if you include the costume designer for that one shot. Um, Miss 45, Abel Ferreira, played the first oh, guy he was to the attack rapist. her. Yeah. The killer chases Dolores through the plants for still more of the gangster rock song. She falls and hides in place near a bush, but gives her location away when out of nowhere a dog runs by and she screams. <laughs> it's just like, who the fuck's dog is out here in the middle of the night? It wasn't like it was a coyote or something. It was just a regular domesticated dog. 
While the killer chases her around, Dolores' shirt happens to pop open, exposing her breasts, and finally, the killer catches up and finishes her off. For the last beat of the song's drum, we see a stopwatch click off at 30 seconds. But how long would you guess that song has been playing for? <laughs> yeah. Well, but you have to, there's two kills here. So I think they they get at least 60 seconds to make this. How long do you think the song has been playing for? <laughs> two and a half minutes. Richard, what's your guess? Uh, I'm going to say three and a half minutes. Seven minutes and 31 what? seconds. <laughs> I was the closest without going over. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. It starts at 55.33 and it finishes at 103.04. So seven minutes and 31 seconds of gangster rock. They might have even like chopped the song up and just played huge sections of it more than once. I'm sure they did. We cut to the principal's office the next day where Guglioni is trying to convince a concerned parent that their child will show up in time for the graduation ceremony. Yeah. So at this point I was like, why is no one reporting all of yeah. these missing persons? Yeah, this is really the first we see of that. Guglioni begs his secretary to stop patching these calls through to his office, but she keeps doing it. We cut outside pointlessly for a moment, and then back to the principal arguing with his secretary some more, until his day is interrupted by Inspector Halliday, here on behalf of the missing children. Halliday starts his line of questioning by admitting that he hates schools, and he wants out of here as soon as possible. He's gotten lots of calls about the missing kids from the track team. Again, Guglioni assures the inspector that the kids are just out raising hell for their last night of high school. It seems like Halliday's on the same page with the principal and has no intention of hunting these kids down. He's just like, check these three places. If they're not there, we did our job. Down on the track, we see Pete line up for a practice at the pole vault run. When he moves down the track, he locks the pole in place and he clears the bar and falls out of frame until we hear his blood-curdling screams. And then we see the aftermath of the jump. Somebody has lined the landing cushion with razor-sharp spikes, and Pete is stabbed completely through like 20 times all over his body. Yeah, as soon as he went up and over the bars and I heard the scream, I was like, oh, there better be a bed of nails yeah. on the other side. Yeah, but but I like that the, they were hidden because they probably weren't piercing the whole way up out of right, the pillow right, right. until he fell into it. That makes sense. But does that mean that there's just a whole bunch of, like, fencing swords underneath that's what i think the killer did i think they lifted up the cushion and just stabbed it with swords. 50 swords from underneath <laughs> such an inefficient way to kill somebody yeah but it's fun it's the most fun kill in this movie this is the sixth person that we've seen killed six dead people so far by the way yeah the stopwatch clicks off the principal catches the inspector checking out the school's trophy case. Halliday says it's a shame they had to fire the coach for no reason, and Guglioni agrees. But that's the way it is in public life. You're only as good as your last mistake. But to be fair, the girl who died, whether or not it was his fault, won the race she was in. So <laughs> what mistake is he even talking about? Okay, so I did Google it, by the way. If you die, they take your win away? No. Running... And being extremely athletic can cause blood clots, but it doesn't cause blood clots when you're running. It will cause it when you sit for extended periods of time because you. So have, he actually might have extended her life by yeah, making her run. Because you have uh, increased the uh, pressure of the blood, the 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 size of your your veins and your arteries, ah. and so when you sit for a long period of time, it will allow blood to pool and clot in a way that it wouldn't on a, on a normal sized artery and so you know athletic people have a tendency to get blood clots in you know situations like airplanes oh okay yeah that makes sense not because of the elevation though just because they're sitting for extended periods of time i assume so yeah maybe the elevation contributes i don't know i didn't read that far because i didn't care it wasn't the running that caused it it's all right <laughs> i think you're a doctor <laughs> We cut back to the shop class where Halliday finds the coach slumped over in a chair. At first, he's not responding to the inspector's questions, and he seems completely dead. Yeah. But eventually, it becomes clear that he's just fired and depressed. He has no info for Halliday, and the inspector leaves. But we see the photo of the team framed on his desk, but there's no lipstick on it. Michael pulls open his desk to reveal a pair of leather gloves inside, so he has the black gloves also. And he clearly has a stopwatch. Right, because he's been using it during all the track meets. We get yet another scene of the principal trying to cheer up parents. We see the two chatty Cathys again, chronically talking over each other in the locker room, until Doris notices a big smear of blood across the front of a locker, two over from hers. She's disturbed by the mess and calls Joanne over to see it. 
we can tell from here that the locker is slightly open. It's like cracked a bit. Right. And Doris pulls it all the way and Sally's body falls out and like collapses on her. So amazingly, this is the first body discovered of all six victims. Impressively, Doris manages not to piss herself at this discovery. <laughs> Coach Michaels and then Kevin arrive in rapid succession and Coach literally grabs the murder weapon yep. and yanks it out of the locker barehanded. Doris and Joanne go running outside to shout for the police, and Kevin seems to think that Coach Michaels is the killer since he's standing here holding the weapon, and the two are quickly at each other's throats. But the, but they'll clearly be able to tell that this body has been dead longer Yeah, he than didn't just do this. Moments. Outside, Joanne and Doris are telling people, including the police, that Coach tried to kill them. Coach wins the fight with Kevin and knocks him against the lockers before running off. The inspector arrives with McGregor and Anne behind him, and Kevin tells them to go after Coach Michaels. The inspector finds the framed photo with the full track team. Every face but Kevin's and the coach's is X'd out in lipstick, which is seven faces. So someone got killed that we didn't see. Or is it Laura. Laura's face? Was Laura on this picture? She should have been. Yeah. When would her face have been crossed out? Maybe she's the first face that gets crossed out. I have a hard time telling who's who in this picture. They're, they're yeah. only crossing off the faces of people that are getting killed right but they do it right before they kill them so maybe the first face we see crossed out is laura's no the first face we see crossed out is paula's because it's a it's a blonde girl oh okay. and it's right after maybe. she gets her slow her slope threat <laughs> <laughs> it's right after she gets her throat slit in the woods okay i don't know i don't get it but there's seven faces that are crossed out and we're also going to hear a name later of a person that we didn't see get killed and confirms that this is a photo of the full track team Coach runs across the street from the school into the wilderness, and Kevin follows him. The coach hides behind a tree and waits for Kevin to pass, and then jumps out for a two-handed Captain Kirk punch to his gut and knocks the kid down. Kevin says that he's going to make the coach pay, when suddenly Anne is here too, telling Kevin that he can't win this fight alone. What does that mean? Like, tag me in? Like, are we gonna, <laughs> we're going to fight this guy together? I don't understand what's happening. I guess because he's a, technically supposed to be a kid? I don't know. The scene gets weirdly complicated here. The fight between Coach and Kev breaks up into another chase, and Anne stumbles upon Halliday out here, insisting that he find them before anyone else dies. He's still not clear on her connection to all this, and neither am I, other than her sister died in a freak accident, and now she wants to. Coach stumbles across Ralph's body and is startled enough that Kevin catches up with him, Coach Michaels denies ever killing anyone and blames all these incriminating coincidences on a misunderstanding. I was there. I saw you, killer. What are you talking about? At first I thought we were about to get Kevin's POV of Michaels committing one or all of these kills, but then he elaborates, You killed Laura. You all killed her. And now it's clear that Kevin has also misunderstood what happened to his girlfriend, just like her sister didn't get it. And everyone else's involvement? Yeah. Because what did the other people have to do? They were enthusiastic with... about sports. Kevin and Anne have the exact same motive and dysfunctional brain, and it might have been fun to learn that they were both killing the track team this whole time without ever knowing what the other person was up to. Like, we just had two killers with the exact same motive trying to avenge the same girl. Or that she finds out that kevin is the killer and lets him get away with killing michaels like just lets him finish what he yeah. started like yeah i condone everything you're doing but here kevin confesses to everything you killed sally sally ralph diane paula tony pete so sally got sword stabbed through the neck ralph got football stabbed paula got her throat slit tony got his head cut off pete jumped and crashed through the spiky mat yeah yeah at the high jump we had no diana diane the name diane i th i thought that dolores was the one who was with him on the park bench when tony got killed was that not dolores uh no that was no yeah that was dolores sorry because there's another character named doris that i got confused with right that's the, the van white, white character yeah. yeah so dolores is the supposed to be the other body not diane okay so he says diane on accident 
Uh, is that literally just a mistake in the movie? Because that, he, do, he never says Dolores' name, and he says that he killed someone named Diane. And there is a Diana. Is there? In the credits. I don't think we see a Diane die unless that's who gets killed with Tony. Maybe we're seeing an alternate edit if it was a video nasty. I don't know. That's weird. Because I was sure that that was supposed to be the Dolores character, but I don't know if that was Linnea Quigley that gets killed with Tony there. Let's see if Wikipedia has any answers for me. I'm getting in. Yeah, no, it says Dolores is missing. So I think that's just straight up a mistake. I think he says Diane when he meant Dolores. And for some reason, they crossed off one extra face. Unless maybe they shot a scene where he killed someone named Diane and then they didn't use it. Yeah. yeah. For some reason. That's because it seems like they're always one face ahead on the X marks. Yeah. He claims they all needed to be punished for causing Laura's death by just, you know, being enthusiastic about sports. But he saved Coach Michaels for last on purpose. And we see Kevin clickstart a pocket watch to count the last 30 seconds of Coach Michaels' life. He starts shouting at Michaels the way Michaels shouted at Laura to cross the finish line. Come on, Laura! Come on, you can do it! Come on, just a little bit more! Move your ass, Laura! Kevin claims that he and Laura had plans to marry this very afternoon, <laughs> immediately after the graduation ceremony. We're going to be married. Laura and me. Married. Today. Just after graduation. Today! Today, Michaels! <laughs> he lunges forward with a knife, and Coach Michaels is able to do an over-the-shoulder throw and drops Kevin hard on his ass. Kevin drops his knife in the fall, and when Coach Michaels scoops it up, just as Halliday emerges from the bushes and misunderstands the scene, he fires on Coach Michaels to protect Kevin on the ground, and Michaels is dead beside Ralph's body yeah. on the ground. It, it's, it's a weird thing, too, because he draws his gun, takes aim, and fires, and Michaels is hit once, but then when we cut back to Halliday, he's got his gun back down, pointed back down at the ground and then he lifts it up again to take aim again it's yeah it's like it's like what are you doing why, why did you stop aiming at him I just bring it up once per shot yeah just in case halliday helps kevin up and asks him to turn in an official report to explain exactly what happened here today we cut to principal guglioni's office where Anne is asking Blondie about her sister's trophy, the one she was supposed to receive during the undoubtedly canceled graduation ceremony. I don't know why this trophy thing had to happen at all. Why couldn't she just be in town because she was going to see the graduation yeah. and she, her sister's not graduating anymore, so she's in town because she already booked her flight or whatever to see yeah. family. Sure. But they made up this dumb thing where she's going to get a trophy at a ceremony, and the ceremony doesn't even happen. Well, we never the, see these kids graduate in the graduation day movie. Right, but it, that's true. That is kind of weird. But it is the impetus that then gets her to go back to Kevin's house. Yeah. So when she finds out that Kevin collected it, and not only that, but that Kevin said she asked him to come collect it, but Anne just goes along with that story because she doesn't want to get him in trouble. Which is, which is what was leading me to believe that she suspects kevin but is like no kevin did kevin did the right thing right yeah he's he saved the day just now i mean kevin's not the kind of boy that would lie is he no no of course not Anne heads to kevin's home and walks right in again uninvited i don't even think she knocks this time she just opens yeah. the door and walks into the house and we never explain the weird decor of this house, no, right? No. Like it's covered in what looks like art artifacts, like <laughs> yeah. statues and paintings, but it also looks like a frat house. Yeah, in places because there's signs and shit hanging on the walls. Yeah, and it just looks untidy, like just piles everywhere and, and, and sort of... Hoarders-y. Yeah. Well, you, you know what? I, it's funny, like now that we're talking about it more elaborate uh, with and with the kind of... Uh, dementia old lady it kind of reminds me of uh mods trailer oh yeah, yeah, yeah. mod just like an eccentric collection of things random things that make her happy she's keeping the things that spark joy richard mm -hmm. this time Anne ventures as far as the stairs and when she gets to kevin's room upstairs she finds a bed with axes crossed on the wall over the headboard 
and lots of mounted swords. She also sees someone in a cap and gown sitting in a chair facing the window. Excuse me. I didn't know anyone was here. <laughs> she realizes as she moves around the front that her sister Laura is the one in the chair, a rotting corpse with blackened, bulging eyes. Kevin sneaks out of the shadows of the room to hold a hand over Anne's mouth and remind her that his grandma downstairs can't hear shit. Kevin tells Anne how angry it made him that they just tucked his girlfriend underground and stopped talking about her the moment she died. I'm glad you're the one that's here, Anne. I want you to be the first one to kiss the bride. The bride? Well, sure, we're going to get married just after graduation, just like we planned. When Anne looks less than thrilled for their union, he turns on her like he did with the rest of the team, and she shoves him away against the wall. He grabs a knife off of his dresser and starts to follow Anne around the room. They rotate around the chair Laura has been seated in until Kevin is on the window side, and then Anne ducks down behind the rocking chair and shoulders it forward, launching her sister's corpse at the maniac and pushing them both out the window down to the front lawn. I mean, I think he attacks her in a way that she falls down and yeah. hits the rocking chair. Maybe that's what happened. It, it, it all happens really quick, and it doesn't make any sense in any <laughs> logic. Yeah. Anne races down the stairs, and just as she opens the front door, Kevin just enters, carrying her sister, like he doesn't even see her, like yeah. she's invisible. He's just like, oh, sorry, we accidentally fell out the window. I laughed so hard <laughs> at this scene, because she looks out the window, and she sees them both like on the ground. I was like, oh okay well he's this definitely is the halloween moment yeah he's definitely not dead she's gonna go outside and check on them and either they're both gonna be gone or just he's going to be yeah. gone yeah. i did not expect him to carry her through the threshold like a married yeah. couple <laughs> that'd be great if there were there were two rows of footsteps running away from the scene <laughs> like somehow they were both alive uh yeah and he doesn't there's no acknowledgement um and, and it's like he never even expected to try to open the door. Right. Like he just fully expected someone to open oh, the door. Oh, thank you for opening it. Yeah. I'm going to carry this up. And, uh, I'll be right with you. But she's, Anne is still in shock here, but she decides that it's better to just leave. So she just makes a run for it. But then we get this bullshit horror movie flat-footed run down the street where she's just like, ugh, ugh, like her whole body weighs 100 just pounds. Flopping. Well, like she's not someone who's been through like basic training. Basic training. Yeah. <laughs> Um, although what I thought was going to happen because they keep cutting back to the track race yeah. I was like, is she going to throw a clot <laughs> oh god yeah. <laughs> it's like something it's something genetic in their family she's going to yeah. have a blood clot but once again because he's not chasing her absolutely immediately like she's running away second movie in a row take your goddamn shoes off she's wearing these like wedges you know like yeah, these, yeah, yeah. these dress up shoes and I'm like you got heels on lady take them off we crossfade from Anne running to her sister running, and eventually Anne is also on the field at the school, running blindly along, even nearly crashing into a hurdle, despite the wide open field to run in. She finally stops to catch her breath for a moment when Kevin arrives, wielding a knife, and we finally get to see some of her Navy training in action. She knocks Kevin to the ground, but infuriatingly lets him keep the knife. Like, she just leaves the weapon with him and then moves away. That wasn't part of the thing she learned in the Navy. I guess. <laughs> She runs under the bleachers, and he's magically in front of her again, tortoise in the hairstyle. Hairstyle? <laughs> what? Hairstyle? That sounds weird. He chases her deeper and deeper under the bleachers until she trips over some big cushions, and he turns her face to show her the decapitated head that he must have hidden down here. Yeah, he's just been stashing bodies under the bleachers. Yeah. Uh, this head is supposed to be Dolores' head. But they shot this scene before they fired the actress for refusing to do nude scenes, and then they never reshot with Linnea Quigley. So the character of Dolores is kind of played by two actresses. <laughs> but we see the original actress's head here made up to look like a decapitated head. Another cabinet is knocked open, and we see Pete's body, with all the spikes through it, hanging on the door. So he went to the mat yeah. under the high jump, and he painstakingly clipped every yep. sword tip that was stabbed through this guy so that he could move him with all the spears the still poking still through sticking him. out of him and then and hung then him, hung him vertically on the back door of a cabinet i can't remember if it's in this scene or if it's in the original scene where he's stabbed but he's clearly breathing like one of these <laughs> probably swords both. is bouncing yeah, yeah. <laughs> and shoves kevin back against pete's body and he is run through with all of the same spikes that killed yeah. pete <laughs> 
and then he chokes on his own blood while collapsing to the floor. We fade to black, and then back up in Laura's room, where Anne is packing to leave in the morning, and Mom pops in to say goodnight. That night, while Anne is lying in bed, we see the bedroom door kicked in by Kevin, who stumbles through the room with a knife in his hand, and mumbles to Anne, Took it from the grave. Mom appears in the doorway to flip on the lights, and we match cut from Kevin standing over her to stepdad standing in the same exact place and pose. I actually really like this effect. Yeah. Where he transforms into a different yeah. person when the lights But instead come of having like a, a knife, he's got a beer bottle. Right. He's holding his liquor. He was like drinking vodka or something. Um, and Anne was kind of having a nightmare or just replacing the image with what she thought she saw. Mom drags stepdad back out of the room and flicks the lights back off on her way out. And the next morning, Anne gets into a taxi, waves goodbye to her mom before leaving town again, and the taxi drives under the graduation day banner, and we freeze frame for red credits to scroll up the screen, which red credits are always an awful idea. Yeah. uh, I will say that this movie didn't scare me much. No. But this last scene, when it slow pans from her to the door and then back to her, while I didn't find it was inherently scary... I was watching it with my head in my hand and one of you two messaged me. And so my watch went ding and buzz and went, ah! <laughs> it's too close to me. What's happening? It freaked me out because I was not <laughs> expecting my watch to go off right then. That's funny. The only scare in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some things that I noticed that this movie has in common with our previous movie. I don't know how many of these coincidences you guys noticed. take your shoes off is that the one take your shoes off that's it <laughs> a woman with combat training flies in from another country after the death of her sister oh. she is later presented with her sister's corpse and then kills her sister's murderous boyfriend they also both have characters named pete and tony i would say that in firecracker that was not her boyfriend why was her bracelet in his bedroom Oh, you think they had a relationship? I think so. I oh. think he fucked both of these sisters. Oh. For sure. Uh, I don't know about that, but... You think he stole the bracelet off of her? You think he's that petty? I don't know. Maybe it just ended up in his stuff when he killed <laughs> I her. Like I like that. I'm know. I'm worried about his reputation. Like, yeah, yeah, He's yeah. so petty that he would steal a bracelet off the girl he murdered. How dare you? That is Chuck Donner we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um... I could have done with some more graphic kills in this one. Yeah. Uh, The plot is all over the place. There's no protagonist, really. It's just kind of a series of scenes. It feels like it was directed by someone who's never directed a movie before, and Herb Freed has. Um, But it it just feels like it was very free form. Yeah. Uh, It it was trying so hard to build red herrings. Yeah, you can't have every character be a red herring. Yeah. Like, you can have suspects. And and you can have a a uh, and then there were none style kind of like oh I I suspected this person then I suspected this person because right. this person was eliminated yeah like yeah that that's that's okay but you can't like establish that everyone owns gray tracksuits and black gloves and stopwatches and then also not follow up on any of those things because yeah. the person who did the killing had none of them. I, I mean, obviously no, he, he did, did have them because he, he used did them. them, but we never see that person. Like they never hint at this person owning the one. Yeah. So until someone admits to the killing, the only people we see have anything in common with the killer are not the killer. Yeah. And also the person who plays the killer in this movie is in like one scene at the very beginning of the movie and then only comes back to be the killer where we spend like a couple random scenes with the sister for no reason. The sister plays no part in the story. Uh, the coach plays almost no part in the story. It's just random people. Yeah, like we spend a lot of time with the principal. Yeah. You even spend a lot of time with Mr. Roberts, the piano teacher. Who doesn't even die. Like, yeah, yeah what's what, the point Why of wasn't that he scene? dead? Why Why didn't the stepfather die? Why didn't the piano teacher die? You set up these people that are asshole characters. Team. But why does the track team need to die? Yeah, yeah McGregor should have died. Like McGregor, I, I kept in my notes thinking, oh, did I mention that McGregor died? And then realizing I was thinking of Walt Gorney getting killed in Friday the 13th Part 2 because mm. I was so sure that he was going to get strangled around that tree when he goes to smoke that joint. Mm-hmm. But it's literally only the people on the track team. And the weird thing is that the track team is made up of a high jumper, a gymnast, 
Mm-hmm. It's like these these a are football not player. Th- yeah, a, a guy on the football team. <laughs> it's like have these other are not interests. Yeah, but it it's not it's not a motley crew. <laughs> you know, it it doesn't make sense that that they all have different specialties on the track team. The, the track team is kids that run fast. Like yeah, you, but you can be part of more than one sport. I'm saying you can't. I'm saying pick a fucking sport. Pick a lane and stay in it. <laughs> but I still think it's weird that they they never show anybody running who gets killed. Yeah. They're all slow enough for this well, dude track that's not on the, over. Yeah, but why is Kevin able to catch up with all of these runners if he's not on the track team? No, Kev- Kevin is on the track team, I thought. Oh, right, because he's in the picture. Yeah. So he must have been their star. Yeah. Other than his girlfriend. Why doesn't he kill himself? Isn't it equally his fault yeah. as much as it is theirs? Yeah, what did he do that was better than anybody else on the team? Yeah. They all encouraged her. Yeah, the whole crowd was encouraging her. Yeah, he has to kill everyone in this whole town. Mm-hmm. What was his long-term plan? Was he going to just keep the body and marry it and live upstairs with his... It was going to be like a psycho situation. He just keeps a dead body in the uh, upstairs bedroom. Well, well, and that's the funny thing is that they, they play a very psycho-esque right. music cue when the body comes comes through uh, the window. But yeah, th- there's no there's no end game. I guess the end game would just be he would eventually be caught because he's crazy. Uh, and and that's the other problem that I have. It's like, is he crazy because he's mad at everyone for killing his girlfriend, and at the same time he's marrying her this afternoon? That 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 would be crazy. But it's like, so did anybody kill her, or is oh, she fine? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Hey, it's the same problem that I had uh, with "Don't Go in the House" when he has this mother that he keeps upstairs and we weren't sure how long she's been dead for because he just keeps lying about things that his mom would do and then he goes up and he finds her dead and he freaks out and we're like does he do this every time has she been dead forever does he is she even dead now he still talks to her after that it's weird anyway i would say this is probably still a thumbs down for me there's not enough going for it if there's anything going for it it's vanna white saying that she pissed herself (laughs) and that's it yeah, I'm going to give it a thumbs down. I don't think I would tell anybody that this is a must watch. Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely a thumbs down as most horror films tend to be with me. Uh, but this one, especially not great. Yeah, it's just not well thought out. The script is all over the place. Um, letterboxed. Richard, what are you thinking? Uh, this replaced my previous number 47. Uh, although... I had a I have a hard time uh I did put this above Firecracker. Oh okay. Uh and so, but it is still below my bloody birthday. Sorry, not my bloody birthday, just bloody birthday. I don't know why I added the my. Cuz of my bloody valentine. That's why you did it. That is why. Which is probably right around the same place on your <laughs> list. Uh where is it? I'm assuming it's lower because it had really graphic kills and you don't like that. Uh, it's at 25. Oh okay. Uh what do you think, Jess? I have it at number 40 out of 52. Um, it is below Modern Romance and ablo- I, above, and above Bloody Birthday. Oh, okay. Um, I have it in 38th place, so I also put it above Firecracker. Um, a few spots above Firecracker. It's 38th out of 52, which puts it below Going Ape and just above Earthbound. Okay, I, I asked you guys to come up with alternate titles for this. J- Jesse, I don't think, came up with one. Not that graduation day is good. We don't condone that because stabby no one graduates. Stabby day. There stabby you go. Stabby day. Stabby day. That's fine. It has to be <laughs> has to end in day, apparently, yeah. if you want to make money in <laughs> oh, 1980. Okay. That's not true. You can I, pick whatever. Yeah, I, I, ha- I have a whole bunch of that right Okay, down. what do you got? What do you got? <laughs> My first one's kind of a thinker. Uh, three minutes. Because it's all of the kills added up? Yeah. It was 30 se- six kills, 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, I, I I was trying to put like maybe like three, three minute, minute warning or I was, I was trying to think three minute mile but that's not that's too fast yeah <laughs> that's a really fast <laughs> that's a really fast <laughs> that's a really fast mile um I was I, I wish was, like, this movie was that fast I was thinking like three minute lap but yeah three minutes uh do you did you have some pet or I just had running for your life oh, okay I I had runners die trying to play off runners, runners high, high. Uh. um but this is my favorite Alma murder. <laughs> Oh, no. Because of the graduating. No. (laughs) That's great. No. Magna cum laude. What? That doesn't make sense. (laughs) Because it's not a college. It's a high school. 
coach death. Perfect. Know. What? <laughs> These are all terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Our director here was Herb Freed. He was a former rabbi, which might be why he shied away from any extremely graphic stuff. Uh, we just reviewed his work writing and directing Beyond Evil for a mini-sode review recently. This movie was partly inspired by his wife's insistence that there was a formula for good horror movies, and she would sit with a stopwatch measuring the time between kills. She was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, might, she might not be wrong, but I think she miscalculated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she was suffering from cancer during the film's production and sadly passed away before it was released. Our writer, Anne Maurice... She actually appeared as a character in Beyond Evil. Leah Salon, the daughter of John Saxon's neighbor in that movie. The story here was written by David Bond, who also wrote the story for Beyond Evil. The editor was Martin J. Sadoff, who also cut Friday the 13th Part 7, and he was a 3D supervisor on Friday the 13th Part 3. Christopher George played Coach George Michaels. His wife, Linda Day George, was the lead character of the director's previous film, Beyond Evil, and they got along so well that she got her husband to audition for this film, and she got him the job. Do you guys recall the last time an actress talked a film into casting her husband, Christopher? Oh, yeah. Um, shoot. It was The Howling. Yeah, Dee Wallace talked them into hiring her husband, Christopher Stone. Christopher George was Mike Kelly in Grizzly. He's Detective James Dalton in The Exterminator. He's Venarius in Enter the Ninja later this year. So those two guys I mentioned in our Firecracker review are his henchmen. Yeah, yeah. But I know him best as Lieutenant Bracken from Pieces, which is sadly still a couple seasons in the future for us. Yeah. Well, I was going to bring up, he was on Rat Patrol. Oh, was he? <laughs> you know, I never miss a good Rat Patrol reference. Yeah, there you go. Patch McKenzie played Anne Ramstead. The character's name may be a reference to Anne Maurice, who wrote the screenplay. Last year, we saw her as Stella, Martin Mull's horny, unqualified secretary. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the joke was now. Um, where Oh, because she says something like, uh, I can type 30 words a minute. And he's like, okay, that's fine. I, I rarely speak more than 30 words a minute. <laughs> Don't let me laugh at that movie. <laughs> I hate that movie. E. Danny Murphy played Kevin. This was his first film. E.J. Peeker played Blondie. She's also Minnie Faye in Hello, Dolly, which you just which watched. Which I just watched, yeah. Uh, I think it's, is it weird that her character name is just Blondie? Is that a name? At first I thought it was just I him thought it being was him. shitty. That's exactly yeah. what I thought it was. And then Anne called her that, and somebody else calls her that too. And I was like, oh, her name's Blondie. Michael Pataki played Guglioni. He was Monk in Raise the Titanic last year. He's back as Sam in Dead and Buried later this season. He shows up in Remo Williams, Rocky IV, and Halloween IV. Richard Balin played Roberts. That's the piano player. Mm -hmm. He was Freddy in Schizoid last year. I don't remember who Freddy was. Uh, maybe one of the other patients? I can't remember. I think there was only one male patient, and it was Christopher Lloyd. No, he was the maintenance guy. He worked as a maintenance guy when he was not there, but he oh, was there but because he was a patient. He was a patient. Okay. Beverly Dixon played Elaine Ramstead. That's the mother. She played a nurse in Beyond Evil for Freed last year. Virgil Fry played McGregor. He was bandit leader in Borderline last year. He's Lieutenant Mac Druck Il Topo in Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype, which gets a mini so this year. He's back as a crapshooter, and the postman always rings twice later this season. Denise Cheshire played Sally Prescott. She's back as a flying monkey in Under the Rainbow later this season. Probably on account of her gymnastic ability. She's playing a monkey and she probably swings on things. Bill Huffsey played Tony. He was Christopher Donlin on the Fame TV show. He's Zorro in a two-parter Married with Children episode. Linnea Quigley was Dolores. As I mentioned, she was brought on because another actress refused to do nude scenes. Linnea Quigley also was not interested in doing them, but agreed to because she was desperate to be in the film. She was a friend of Felony's lead singer and talked them into working on the movie for free. She plays Trash in Return of the Living Dead. She's Denise in Silent Night, Deadly Night. She's back later this season for Cheech and Chong's Nice Dreams. And then in 2012, she shows up in one of David Dakota's 1313 titles, 1313 Cougar Cult. <laughs> Vanna White was Doris. This was her first film. 
She's back later this season as Rest On Girl in Michael Crichton's Looker. Two years later, she began hosting Wheel of Fortune, which she still does to this day. At the moment, she is credited in 7,233 episodes. That might be 34 now, since I wrote that note. She plays Roxanne in an episode of the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. She's Lori Sanders in an episode of Captain Planet and Coco in an episode of Married with Children. She mostly ends up playing herself in titles like Naked Gun 33 and a Third and Double Dragon. Carl Ray played Ralph Johnson. He appeared on a television show called Mr. Merlin, whose copyright prevented John Borman's Excalibur from being called Merlin, as a character named Steve Harrington, which is very nearly the name of a character from Stranger Things, except in Mr. Merlin, Harrington is spelt with an E instead of an A. Patrick Wright played the truck driver with the little neckerchief. He played Pat the Cop in the 40s from Falling in Love Again last year, back later this year as another truck driver in Carbon Copy. Aaron Butler played the photographer. He wrote Chained Heat, and he appears in that film as Willie. Erica Hope played Diana. She's Annie Smith in Bloody Birthday, the girl who was killed in the open grave for the film's first kill. Grant Loud played the singer of the band. He's a diver in Rat Boy, and as of this year, he is a segment producer on Jeopardy. Felony all played themselves. Their song Fanatic shows up in Valley Girl, The Lonely Lady, and Take Me Home Tonight, and their song Animal appears in Friday the 13th, Part 6. Deborah Dutch played Deborah Darlin. I don't remember a character named that. She plays a cave girl in Fred Olin Ray's Dinosaur Island, and now I'm mad that I neglected that movie when we were picking our favorite cave people, because there's some great ones in Dinosaur Island. Linda Shane played Paula Brentwood. She was Miss Salmon at the Salmon Festival in Humanoids from the Deep. <laughs> yeah. She's the first girl to get killed in this movie, uh, because a blood clot is not a kill. It's just a th- thing that you die from. She's a band member in Munchie and Munchie Strikes Back. She wrote Screwballs and Screwballs 2, and she wrote and directed Purple People Eater alongside directing two episodes of Alex Mack. Mm-hmm. So lots of cool credits from Linda Shane. I think that's everything for graduation day. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Whereas I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We have a Discord now. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. And because this is our first episode of the month again, I wanted to remind our listeners about our Patreon campaign. Vintage Video will always be free to listen to, but if it's worth it to you, a donation as small as a buck a month is greatly appreciated. $5 $5 patrons get a shout out on the show, a monthly exclusive episode reviewing a title from the 70s, and a hand in choosing each month's film. As an added bonus this year, we're starting to fill in some blanks from last year with about 20 minisodes reviewing titles that didn't make the cut from 1980. From August of 1971, our $5 patrons are choosing between the following eight titles Cry Uncle, John G. Avildsen's detective sex comedy about Private Eye Jake Masters, played by Alan Garfield, hired by a millionaire to solve a murder. Doc, Frank Perry's take on the gunfight at the OK Corral, with a focus on Doc Holliday as played by Stacey Keach and featuring Faye Dunaway and Harris Eulen as Kate Elder and Wyatt Earp. Hmm. Harris Eulen as Wyatt Earp. Okay. Yeah. Fool's Parade, Andrew V. McClagland's comedic drama about three ex-cons played by Jimmy Stewart, George Kennedy, and Kurt Russell, who attempt to establish a legitimate business just out of prison, but are defrauded by a corrupt town banker and a prison guard from their past. A Gunfight, an American Western funded entirely by a Native American tribe, about a gunfight between stars Kirk Douglas and Johnny Cash. Johnny Got His Gun, Dalton Trumbo's adaptation of his own 1934 anti-war novel, starring Timothy Bottoms, Kathy Fields, Marsha Hunt, Jason Robards, and Donald Sutherland. Let's Scare Jessica to Death, Let's do it, guys. Hey, don't do not do it. John Hancock's horror film about a recently institutionalized woman who encounters a squatting drifter and becomes convinced that she is a vampire. That sounds like me. The Marriage of a Young Stockbroker, Lawrence Terman's romantic comedy adapted from a book by the graduate author Charles Webb about an insufferable pervert husband, played by Richard Benjamin, trying to spice up his marriage and failing. 
<laughs> that sounds like Richard Benjamin. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> and lastly, the Omega Man, Boris Segal's adaptation of Richard Matheson's 1954 novel I Am Legend, starring Charlton Heston, Anthony Zerby, and Rosalind Cash, about the last man on Earth, each of which will celebrate their 50th anniversaries this coming August. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing High Risk, which IMDb describes like so. Four naive Americans in need of easy cash decide to fly to Colombia and raid the safe of a notorious drug lord with connections to the corrupt military regime. We leave you now with a trailer for High Risk. This is Adios Airlines. We just know you're going to love it down there. The natives are friendly, the women are willing, and we just love Americans. Because down there is five million dollars and a high-risk adventure that never lets you down, down there. Here we come! High risk. Adios.